Hello, my name is Neil Mitchell. Uh, I'm a, now a, a present a senior advisor within the ETA project, on, particularly on magnet affairs. I was formerly uh, head of the ETA magnet division for many years, since 2003. So I've been following the ETA magnets all the way through from the very early design stages, right through to uh, manufacturing, delivery, and now assembly, and we're starting to look at commissioning too. Uh, I'm going to try and summarize within 45 minutes what we have with the ETA magnets, in particular why we have them uh, and how they achieve what we require of them and the particular problems that we have in doing this. So the first step is what the magnets do. Uh, now the plasma is essentially a magnetic bottle. Uh, what, what we want to do is confine uh, charged particles, in the case of a tokamak ca carrying a current, with a series of magnetic fields. Now the magnetohydrodynamic of the plasma uh, is, is carried out by the CS and PF coils. So you see here, um, the, uh, the, they create a force that balances the gas pressure uh, and then the uh, ions and electrons are held in position against the expansion of the gas. The CS and PF uh, also create a current that allows this confinement to take place and also heats the plasma. The point of the TF is to reduce the particle and energy loss. So uh, if you look at the bottom pictures here, you can see the uh, helical pattern of fields uh, on the plasma surface. What you see from these is that the plasma, the, the field lines spiral roughly three times. In order to go once in a poloidal direction, they, they traverse three times around the toroidal direction. Uh, this gives you a long confinement path and reduces the particle and energy losses. So the toroidal field in a, in a tokamak has a strictly a confinement function. It, it doesn't contribute to the uh, magnetohydrodynamics of confining the gas. Uh, now, how do the magnets provide this confinement? What we have here uh, are the forms of the poloidal field coils and central solenoid. What you can see on the left uh, are the, is the plasma shape, and there, top and bottom, we have what we call plasma nulls. Uh, these are magnetic zeros, uh, one of which is the, forms the diverter. You can see overlaid on this picture on the left, uh, the diverter lines. Uh, and on the Right, you can see the individual poloidal coils and their main functions. This you can relate back to the, the form of the plasma. So you can see the, the red dotted lines which produce the, the null points and you can see that the PF1 and PF6 coils are attracting the plasma out, uh, pulling it to form the diverter. The two coils on the outside on the far right balance the plasma outward expansion, they push it backwards uh, and the central solenoid stack more or less produces the current that, uh, that, that flows and which provides you your, your ability to confine the charged particles. Uh, there is a bit of a blurring between this, of course, but this is the basic functionality. Now, why do we have uh, six poloidal field coils? Uh, the poloidal field coils uh, are chosen because you have to get into the in-vessel components. So if you look on the right, you can see that we have uh, essentially five big access gaps uh, between the six poloidal field coils. And these are all critical for access to the vacuum vessel and in-vessel components for uh, transport of uh, cooling, cooling gases, liquids, uh, and also um, exhaust of the uh, neutral beam injectors, plasma heating and, and gas exhaust. Uh, if you have six poloidal field coils, you become quite limited as to what you can control. So you also see shown on the picture on the, uh, the right, the marks near the plasma surface, the labeled G1 to G6. These are the points that we control in the plasma surface. Uh, you can't control more points than you have poloidal field coils. So we have a limitation on how accurately the plasma surface can be controlled. Uh, so ITER in this respect is, is is quite limited. If you look, for example, on the left with D3D, you can see you have many poloidal field coils. This gives you much greater accuracy on controlling the plasma surface, but on the other hand, it's rather difficult to get into the in-vessel components. Uh, now, plasma shaping here, 
Uh, this is, is quite an important feature of ETA that uh, you, you create an elongated plasma. So basically the plasma is trying to go outwards. So you see on the picture on the right, the plasma has a bursting force. It's a little bit like a, a, a current, it is a current ring, which tends to expand or a, a pressure vessel, which tries to expand. You apply a restoring force to that uh, and you squash the plasma outwards. The result of that is that you have a curved field also shown on the picture on the right. Uh, this curvature means that once the plasma starts moving off axis, uh, the destabilizing force increases and increases. Uh, and the, the plasma will essentially, it's called a vertical disruption. It will just rush off and crash into the diverter or the top first wall. Uh, now, you have to control this, so we have active stability control in ETA. This is because of the elongated plasma. Uh, and this uh, is, a, is a major design issue, of course, that you, ha you then have to have active stabilization and you require AC operation of some coils. Uh, now, what does all this mean for the magnets? Now, the first point is that uh, magnetic forces in ETA are gigantic. Uh, if you look at the picture on the left, you can see that within the central solenoid, the, uh, the vertical forces, I've picked some examples here, the vertical forces at the central, uh, center of the central solenoid are 50,000 tons from the top and 50,000 tons from the bottom. Uh, on the TF coils, one individual TF coil tries to move inwards with a force of 40,000 tons. Uh, now that is balanced within the, all of these magnetic forces have to be balanced by contacts between the structures. So the CS, it's a, a stack of coils that self-react most of the forces. For the TF, there is a wedging in the central vault. Uh, this provides, a, a, it's, it's like a, a bridge, it's a vault, uh, and it reacts that 40,000 tons by hoop compression. You also have, uh, it's worth noting on these the, these forces here, 40,000 tons per TF coil. This compares to a TF coil weight of about 300 tons. In other words, the, the magnetic forces are vastly more significant than the gravity forces, which we tend to neglect in operation. They're negligible. You can see also here on the picture on the bottom right, uh, because of the poloidal field, you get what we call outer plane loads on the TF coils. These outer plane loads go up to about 1,500 tons per meter. Uh, it, it, they tend to create a, a torsional effect of the TF coils. Uh, this compares to gravity, which is about three tons per meter. Again, we're, we're between two and three orders of magnitude higher with the magnetic forces than the gravity forces. Uh, now, coming to vert plasma vertical stability control, to provide a fast response, we have to have a fairly simple uh, control system. So we connect the coils in groups. We have three possible groups for vertical stability control. We have VS1, which uses the green PF coils, VS2, which might not be installed. It's a kind of backup. And the VS3 is the in-vessel coil. So VS1 and VS3 is what we will rely on. Now, these coils are always connected in up-down series so that they more or less create a horizontal field at the plasma axis. So that simply by providing a current that's proportional to displacement in the right direction, you can force the plasma back. And that's the principle of this, this stability system. There is quite a lot of history to the VS1 and VS3. Originally, we didn't have VS3, and this was added about 10 years ago. Uh, theoretically, you could do without VS3, but, but I think practically now in ITA, it's, it's a requirement for operation. The, the, the VS2 system could provide some backup if it failed. Uh, we have s simulations of vertical stability. Uh, now, the extent of the... Uh, ETA plasma vertical stability isn't actually known. We can do simulations uh, based on injections of noise into the uh, vertical stability controller, uh, but until we really have a plasma and can see what sort of behavior it has internally, we won't know. You get quite a high frequency. Uh, it's up to about 100 hertz. This produces quite a large AC loss. This is a form of, of eddy current heating within the, co the superconductors. Uh, I put on the, the pie chart on the bottom right some colors that show the relative contributions of heat uh, in, in e 
through average through a, a nuclear burn. So you can see here, actually, the biggest contribution to heating is the pump work. It's circulating the helium. After that, the next one is the AC losses. That's the deep blue. So the light blue is the pump, the, sorry, the medium blue is the pump work. The deep blue is the AC losses. Uh, and the bright red is the nuclear. So actually, on average, through a pulse, the AC losses are more significant for nuclear, for uh, cryoplant loads than the nuclear heating. Uh, if we then come to a, a particular issue that you find during assemblies, it's the final step, it's error fields. Now, error fields are the difference between the ideal magnetic fields and the real ones. So the, the com there is a, a combination of unavoidable field non-uniformities because you have individual coils, not perfect current sheets. So 18 TF coils already creates you a, a, an error field, if you like, a, with a, 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 a cyclic factor of 18. But we also have avoidable error fields, which are due to manufacturing and assembly tolerances. Now, there are, the error fields create perturbations in the, field, in the field lines. If you look again at the bottom with the trajectories of the helical magnetic field lines, particularly the one on the far right, you can see that if you have a, a field perturbation, uh, an error field, it perturbs the, disturbs the field lines, which then either you have an internal disturbance with, with the particle confinement in the plasma, or they impact the first wall in a non-uniform way. And I'll come back to that in the later slide. Uh, now, particle confinement, you, you have, this is the, the, the particle confinement issue, that if you have uh, inside the plasma error fields, you can create magnetic islands. The, they develop within the plasma uh, and you, 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 you degrade the energy confinement and eventually you get trapped particles and it, it leads to a disruption. Perhaps it can be recovered, perhaps not. But essentially error field correction is, is, is absolute requirement in high performance large tokamaks. That's the first error field issue. The second error field issue is the heat flux control challenge. Now, the, the plasma, of course, has lots of neutrons which go into the blanket and aren't an issue here. Also, there is alpha particles and any uh, losses. And approximately 100 megawatts in nuclear burn is coming out uh, along, essentially down to the diverter. If you look at the picture on the, uh, on the right here, uh, if we have a, a the, 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 the kind of pink thing is the, is the plasma. And if you can see here, it's showing a, a, an, what we call a, an N equals one, a, a toroidal asymmetry of wavelength one. You can see what will happen. It, it, it moves the, the field lines very slightly, a very few millimeters, but it, it's sufficient to create a very high extra heat load on the first wall because instead of distributing it uniformly, all the heat, uh, is is comes out at one point and you'll get hot spots and this can le lead to first wall erosion and and of course um, can impurities into the plasma so for both of these uh, aspects we have to control error fields now we we have correction coils on ETA. these are complicated items that sit outside the toroidal field coils uh, we have uh, top um, bottom and side we have uh, 18 of these, uh, and I, I won't talk about them in more detail. They're superconducting, but very approximately, they increase the allowable tolerance on the coil positions from roughly plus or minus one millimeter to something that becomes a bit more doable, something around plus or minus five millimeters. Uh, it might not seem much, but this is critical when you're doing assembly. One millimeter is challenging, five millimeters very roughly we can do. Okay, coming now to the superconductors. Uh, superconductor at the base level means that the coil's got zero resistance and you, current flows with little. It, it's not zero resistance because we have joints within the superconductor. Uh, heating, you might think this is great, but of course you don't get something for nothing. Uh, practical superconductivity means you have to operate at four degrees Kelvin. 
Uh, to keep the coils cold, we need thermal insulation, which brings all sorts of issues. It means you have to have a cryostat vacuum. You have to limit contacts to warm structures. Mechanical, the mechanical supports all have to be cold and heat and loads have to be reacted internally. We need thermal radiation shields. You cannot accept the thermal radiation from room temperature to 4K. You must intercept it at an intermediate level, which is 80K. Uh, and of course, you have to get current and, and coolant into the coils, which is complex because also here you have to control heat loads. The only real positive thing here, apart from the low resistance, of course, is that the mechanical strength at 4K is much better than at room temperature. Uh, I present one slide on superconductivity. You have a thing called the critical surface. Uh, you have three parameters uh, which can which can break superconductivity. You have a critical temperature, uh, a critical field, uh, and a, a critical current. If you exceed any one of these parameters, you will your superconductivity stops, uh, and the superconductor becomes resistive. This produces, as it's shown on the figure on the left, a critical surface here. Uh, for the uh, for ITER, we're generally working for the toroidal field coils. We're working at a constant current, which means a constant um, current density, uh, and we we work at pretty much a constant field. So we're always concerned with moving along the t the t axis here. If you look at the CS and PF coils, then we're changing current, field, and temperature. So we have a more complex variation. Uh, this, this surface we call the critical surface, and you have to stay a, a suitable margin below it. The, the problem is that once you get to it, the, the, the coils start heating, and it doesn't need much. that This heat becomes uncontrollable. The, the cooling of the coils is designed for superconducting state. Once you start getting resistive, the, there is an instability and a thermal runaway. Uh, in order to protect the coils, th this would be called a quench, and then we have a, a, a de quench detection system and a fast discharge, which is also a very substantial part of the magnet design, uh, and also the auxiliaries and surround surroundings of the, uh, of the magnet system. The, you have to get the energy out of the magnets very quickly in a few tens of seconds, and you have to dissipate it in res external resistance. Now, uh, the superconductivity also produces some design problems of its own. Uh, zero resistance means you can drive gigantic eddy currents just by changing currents and fields. Uh, and then, uh, as I just talked, we, we, we have a, an inst inherent instability uh, and we have to build in protection. We, a lot of the issues in, in magnet design and the magnet features in ITER are uh, the, the thermal protection against the loss of superconductivity. We have to put extra copper within the superconductor so that it slows the buildup of heat. Uh, and we have to have very high voltages to extract the energy as fast as possible. Now, uh, a few words on practical superconducting wires. The superconductor is divided into fine filaments which are twisted together uh, and embedded in a low resistivity matrix of normal metal. It, it, for ITA, it's it's copper. Uh, typical strands, you can see niobium titanium wire on the bottom left. Uh, the orange is the copper and the kind of gray black thing in the middle of very fine superconducting filaments. Uh, then in the middle, we have a, a niobium three tin wire for ITA. This is uh, an internal tin wire here. The outside uh, kind of browny color is the copper. There is a bright blue um, circulation, uh, circular, oscillating circular um, color. That's the diffusion barrier, which stops tin polluting the copper. Then inside that, the blue dots are the tin sources and surrounding those, the kind of bluey uh, halos are the, the filaments. And then we, we use a limited amount of uh, high temperature superconductors in ITER in the current leads, and I've shown that on the right. Now, superconducting, these strands, uh, for manufacturing reason, reasons, are limited to a diameter of about a millimeter uh, and a current of a, of a few hundred amps. But you have to bundle them together because you can't possibly make coils with a single wire. So what we have in ITER is a cabling conduit conductor, which has something around a, a thousand strands. It varies depending on the conductor. Uh, these are cabled together with a, with a, a multi-stage cable. Uh, and I've 
shown a picture here on the left. It's a TF conductor. You've got a, the gray outer cut is the, is the jacket. It's two millimeters thick. Uh, the black thing in the middle is, is the helium channel. The, there's a spring, an open spring uh, just outside that, which keeps the, the superconductors out of the channel. And then there are the dots around that, which are the, the superconducting strands. And I'll show you these in more detail in a second. Uh, if you look in detail at this, you can also see that actually there are steel wraps on the bundles, that this uh, annulus of orange is divided into six. These are the final cable stage. Uh, there are six bundles of cables forced together on this uh, that make up the final cabling stage. And I'll show you the, a picture of this manufacturing process. Now, if you look within the individual strands, it's not just a, a lump of superconductor. Within the individual strands, uh, the, the structure goes down to the micron level. And uh, this has all to be produced by multiple stages of drawing. So in the next couple of slides, I will show you how what happens if you start zooming into a, a conductor. So we have here the conductor. Then here, if we start looking uh, in, in detail, you can see now that orange are pure copper strands and the ones with a kind of gray in the middle, uh, that's the superconductor. So we, we zoom down here to uh, what you see, the, the strand diameter is about a millimeter, yes? Uh, now we're going to etch the, uh, the copper away. And this allows us to go and, and look with a scanning electron microscope. You can ignore the fracture comments here. This is part of the background of the, preparing this video. But it, it's, um, it, you will now see as we shift to a, a, the scanning electron microscope, this shows you at the 50 micron level, the, the individual bundles of filaments here, that kind of fence around the outside to the diffusion barrier. Uh, and each of these rods that you can see here uh, which has got a size of about three microns. That's a superconducting filament and that's what carries the current. Uh, we go down, I think, to the five micron level here. If you look very carefully, you can see a sort of dendrite structure in each filament. This is the way the niobium 3 tin has been created. Uh, for, it's, it's, a, it's a reaction process. Once the conductor has been deformed into the coil, you have to heat it for uh, 200, 250 hours at 650 centigrade. Uh, and this from ductile metals forms the brittle niobium 3 tin compound. You can also see here, if you uh, look attentively, you can see slight bridges between the individual filaments. Uh, this is something you don't particularly want. We try and pack these filaments as closely together as possible. Occasionally, they don't stay separated, and you'll see little, little bridges between them. Uh, this will create uh, high uh, AC losses. Uh, it's something to be avoided, but we, we have to balance current density against AC losses, so we, we tolerate a limited number of, of bridges between the filaments. Uh, this shows you here uh, how we can do cabling. Uh, this was me about 10 years ago. This is a final stage cabler. On these drums are the six petals. Uh, and you can see here how the drums are paying off. You can see them coming together at the cabling head here. Uh, the bundles are compacted together uh, where that guy is standing looking. Uh, he's looking for broken strands. Then you can see the cable is coming out this is a wrapper that puts a protection, a steel wrap onto the cable uh, here, and you can see it paying out. And then if you look down the cable here, you can see it being spooled. Uh, this is an intermediate step. Having got this, we then, we then have to go and put it inside a jacket by a pull through method, but I won't be talking about that here. Next step is to make a coil. Uh, now, all of this is, we've got the conductors, but the next step is that we have to prepare coil insulation. Uh, now, copper coil tokamaks have been built to high voltage requirements on the PF system for a long time. Uh, they use uh, what we call uh, VPI, vacuum pressure impregnation, 
a glass epoxy system with caps on insulation as a standard. Caps on is a trade name, it can also be called polyamide. Now, for example, jet, uh, the ground voltage is 20 kilovolts and test voltages were about 40 kilovolts. Now, the early superconducting tokamaks were low energy and didn't need to really address the high voltage issue. Uh, and now, but now the superconductor voltage starts dramatically increasing. So the ETA CS model coils factory tested at 30 kilovolts, K-Star was tested at 15 kilovolts and EAST was tested at 6 kilovolts. Glass capped on epoxy is standard. Uh, the, the, issue with, the, the issue with uh, um, glass capped on epoxy is, is, is that it, it's, it's something of a thermal barrier. If you want good stability in a superconductor, you want helium in contact, the, the supercritical helium. The, the glass capped on epoxy doesn't help on this. It, it, it's not a disaster, but it doesn't help. We also have with ITER for the first time significant radiation. And here we use uh, a particular blender. It's not an epoxy resin. It's what's called a cyanide ester, uh, which has good improved bonding and it also has improved radiation resistance. And uh, although you don't always see this, the insulation technology is as critical as the superconducting technology in ITER and containing the voltage is, is uh, frequently more difficult than containing the helium. We worry a lot about helium leaks, but actually we have far more problem with what you could call voltage leaks. Um, this is part of the technology that will be used a lot during assembly. It's passion breakdown. Uh, a va now, a vacuum actually always contains residual uh, gas, uh, which can conduct at a few hundred volts. So a cryostat is not actually insulation. It's, it's a conductor. Uh, it's a good conductor. So you only need a few hundred volts, and you get very large arcs inside a, 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 a a cryostat, the, the, the breakdown distance doesn't matter. A few hundred volts can create you a breakdown over several meters. So you always have to ground uh, coil surfaces facing into the cryostat. As part of the testing here, we, 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 we look at all the coil components, particularly the auxiliaries under low pressure gas while we apply a voltage. This is a, a relatively new technique. We use partial discharge for looking at voids and passion breakdown. I've got some examples here. You, you detect passion breakdown with cameras, so you can see uh, the, the picture in the middle at the top with the orange glow, that's a passion breakdown. You can see a before and after picture on the right here. You can see how the, the, the yellow flash is showing you a passion breakdown. Uh, the, uh, the, the two on the bottom is from the CS. You can see uh, on the left there is nothing, on the right there is the passion breakdown at the location of a, volt of a, volt a high voltage wire extraction. So we do a great many tests with this during manufacturing and we'll be doing even more uh, during uh, feeder assembly and the connections of the feeders to the coils. Uh, coil dielectric insulation, this is another area where, where it, it, it's used extensively on the coils, but it's also going to be a feature of assembly into the cryostat for the feeder joints. Uh, polyimide comes in, it's a dielectric, it withstands voltage with a very low thickness. Uh, but it, it, it's also inflexible and it comes in sheets. So in, in order to prevent gaps, you have to lay it up in quite, it's kind of origami, in patterns. So I've shown here the kind of patterns that you get on the bottom left. It's a, an HTS lead, which of course are at the same voltage of the coils. And at the, um, on the right at the bottom is the terminal region of the TF coil before the... Uh, before vacuum pressure impregnation and before uh, application of a ground coating. And uh, you can see how complex the, the layers of Kapton are. You sometimes have to build 20 layers of this in order that you get a good separation and no possibility of cracks opening between cryostat and high voltage. If you do this, you have a passion breakdown. Uh, now the main features of the TE to TF coils uh, I talk about the TF coils and I'll do the others. TF coils are made up of a winding pack inserted in a thick case. Uh, you can see the main components here on the uh, left of the TF coil structures. Uh, in the middle, it's a pair of TF coils, the red things top and bottom of the pre-compression rings. Uh, and on the right, you can see a cross section. 
the a TF coil has got seven inside it double pancakes and each of these double pancakes has got a radial plate and inside these radial plates we embed the insulated conductor this gives us good protection of the insulation uh, and that allows us to control the dimensions very accurately. Now the TF coils have to be linked together. This picture shows the kind of loads we get. At the start I talked about the loads on individual forces. This is how you have to resist them. Uh, in particular the outer plane loads. The, the noses of the TF coils, which you can see in the picture, the vertical part on the right, are wedged together. But the outer plane forces, which is caused by the interaction with the PF and CS coils, create a kind of torsion. This is shown on the, uh, the picture on the uh, top left with the arrows showing the kind of overturning moment. Uh, now, if you look what you get here, it's shown in the middle picture, and I'll show a video later. Uh, you can see the kind of shape that these the TF coils go into. Uh, the pre-compression rings uh, apply at the top and bottom to pull the coils together, and the outer intercoil structures act as a kind of uh, shear panels between the coils, which which have insulated pins, which resist the the magnetic forces and react it between the individual coils so that we end up with a circular structure that can resist the, the kind of torsional moment that you see on the whole system. Uh, now, if you look at here on the right, we have uh, the in-plane loads. You can see here how the pre-compression rings are tightened, the coil cools down, uh, and then it's energized, and you can see how the nose of the coil moves out and wedges. Uh, this is a displacement plot. You've got a few millimeters. You probably can't read the scale there, but the displacements of the coil are a few millimeters. If we then move to the one on the left, this is the outer plane behavior seen from the inside. So you can see the coil cools down, it shrinks. Uh, then you energize the TF coils and it expands a bit. Now you start doing a plasma pulse and you can see how the outer plane movement will develop. Suddenly the coil will start torsioning. Here it goes and the colors indicate the displacements. That shape is showing a displacement of around 20 millimeters. Uh, so it's a very substantial movement of a very large structure here. Uh, and of course, you have to be very careful that all the, 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 the stresses have been accurately calculated. Uh, this will be part of the commissioning activities to check that the behavior is, is proper. Uh, now the CS coil is a, is a stack in the center of the machine. Uh, it's got six individual coils uh, shown on the, the picture on the left. These coils are stacked on top of each other. Uh, as I pointed out early on, there's 50,000 tons compressing this. Uh, because you also have um, different, in some, during a plasma scenario, you have different currents in these coils and they tend to repel each other. So to keep the whole stack together, you have a, a pre-compression system this, this pre-compression system uh, is provided by tie rods inside and outside, keyed to uh, what we call uh, key blocks at the top and bottom. Uh, and it's preloaded during, in the assembly hall, this stack will be built up and the, um, will be, a preload will be applied before the whole thing is lifted into the center of the machine. Uh, what you can see at the, on the pictures on the right uh, are the support structure to the TF coils and in an individual module. Uh, and then inside this, the, the, the center of this stack, it's not empty, it's where all the helium supplies run. Uh, the current bleeds run on the outside. PF coil features. Uh, here you can see uh, you, you've got, uh, it's what we would call a fairly conventional pan double pancake winding. A uh, double pancake where you start on the inside, go in, transition up, and then wind out to the outside uh, so that you, your joints are always placed on the outside of the coil in the low field region. Uh, the top left picture shows the coil um, winding pack layout. You can see that the cylinder sticking down is, is the, ter are the coil terminals. Uh, you can see the purple things, which are the, the joints between the double pancakes. You can also see on this a mass of pipes because we have to distribute the helium from the coil terminal uh, 
uh, around to the various pancakes all around the coil. So there's a lot of complex system of piping and also wiring on this. The coil is then clamped. These clamps uh, go onto the winding pack. Uh, they support protection covers and they will also form the attachment points to the TF coils. All the PF coils rest on the TF coils. Now, feeders, uh, you have to feed the, the magnets and keep them cold. The, uh, this is a diagram of what you have in a typical feeder system. So starting on the right, you have a dry box. Uh, this is so called because it's supposed to be dry, but it, given any opportunity, it will become wet. Uh, this is where the, the current comes out of the coils. It's the end of the current leads. And because of heat loss into the cold parts, you get water condensation. So the dry box is to, is to keep it's to keep dry, otherwise you build, have very high ice build up on the ends of the current leads. You have a coil terminal box, which is where all the valves are. You have an S-bend box, which provides th flexibility for thermal expansion. You then have a joint, this is the mid joint, and the vacuum barrier, which is actually a, a vacuum barrier to the cryostat vacuum. You then got the cryogenic feed through the CFT. This is a, an extension of the cryostat vacuum through the bio shield. Uh, this leads a bundle of, of buzz bars and pipes into the cryostat. And then within the cryostat, you have the in cryostat feeders, which have many different types. What we're looking at here is a TF coil feeder, but there are quite significant variants on this. Uh, this is the cryostat, of course, the outer part which uh, is an essential part uh, in that all of the magnet feeders have to penetrate through this, through the various openings in it. This provides the high vacuum and the ultra cool environment. Uh, now inside the cryostat here, I tried to show just how crowded things will get. You can start seeing that this at the moment if you look in the, uh, the, uh, set in the pit, uh, how things are building up at the bottom of the cryostat. On the left, the yellow is the cryostat, the orange are the magnets, and you can see there's a reasonable amount of gap between it. The, the orange it also includes the feeders. If you then add on the, the right, the blue, which is the thermal shields, uh, and the green, which is the vacuum vessel, you discover that, that practically your, our access to the bottom of the machine, once everything's in place, is going to be extremely limited. It means that if we want to do any repairs, or even if we want to do some final assembly, uh, the, the conditions are not just the, the, the work that has to be done, it's getting access to it. You will have to, if we have to repair in operation, we will have to do extensive removal of equipment. So this brings us to another point here, that magnets were conceived as semi-permanent components Repair and replacement is difficult and it's probably impossible once nuclear operations start. So critical items like the valves and the current leads are in the CTBs outside the bio shield and hands-on access possible. Uh, but for the rest, uh, we're extremely limited. We've got spare TF and CS coils, but of course to install these means a, a huge uh, um, extraction action on in, in what for the TF, it means cutting the vacuum vessel wells. Uh, and we also have a, a bypass capability in the TF. So we, to do this, we would require full human uh, access to the Christ and I think it would require many months of downtime. It's only possible before nuclear operation. So quality and reliability is a major concern for magnets. Uh, also, we of course have to be very careful during commissioning and, and non-nuclear operation that we find that any potential incipient faults and, and repair them uh, or design, redesign around them before we start the nuclear operation. Now, why in vessel coils? I haven't talked much about the in vessel coils because they're not superconducting, but it's worth noting here that the in vessel coils, what they say, they're in vessel. They're pulse coils and they're there because we need a fast response to the plasma movements. The ETA vacuum vessel is conducting, so acts as an electromagnetic screen. So we have the in vessel coils inside the vessel. This means that it's a very high radiation environment. They have to have mineral insulation, low voltage, they have a bypass capability, but they're not repairable. So we, we have some bridging capability. If they were to fail, we have the capability to use the superconducting coils as at least a, a partial backup, but we might lose some vertical stability capability. 
uh, and they consist that they're fairly simple. It's a copper core with high cooling water flow. Uh, and the white, if you see on the picture on the right, is the magnesium oxide insulation. And then the gray is a steel jacket. Uh, we have two systems. There is the uh, upper, the, the, the vertical stability coil and the elm coils. Uh, the elm coils is, uh, are really aimed at, at controlling edge edge localized modes. Uh, they could also be used for error field control because you you would you have enough of them to get the, the harmonics. Uh, the VS coils are purely for vertical stability control. Now the magnet realization here, this is just to show something about where we are on the magnets. Uh, this shows the magnet system in the cryostat. You've got the cryostat, obviously the galleries, you can see down to the B2. Uh, you've got the feeders, uh, sitting in, in here in the purple colors. Uh, you've got the vacuum vessel in orange, the, the magnet system in blue, uh, sorry, the TF magnet system in blue, and the correction coils in green. This gives you some idea also how crowded the, uh, the, the machine is going to be. It doesn't really show the thermal shields here, which would make things even more crowded. And this shows you uh, a little bit more about just the magnets and how they look. Uh, the magnetic cage here with the central solenoid, the TF coils, the outer intercoil structures and the PF coils surrounding it. Uh, what you see here, now I go through the actual status of these components. This is the pre-compression rings, uh, which you can just see here uh, at the top and bottom there. They're underneath, if you look at the top, there's some, some green uh, flanges of the part of the CS. Just under that, you can see the, uh, a couple of, of red dots. They're the pre-compression rings. Uh, this is the pre-compression rings a few weeks ago. You can see on the right, the big circles on the assembly hall floor. And then just above that, you can see the, the, uh, the 36 counter flanges. Uh, these are the flanges that go inside the pre-compression rings and are, are pulled out onto the TF coils. This provides the pre-compression of the TF coils. Uh, these uh, pre-compression rings are fiberglass, essentially. Uh, the, the top picture on the right shows one during winding, uh, and the one on the bottom right shows in, uh, installation of fiber optic strain gauges that will allow us to work out the amount of pre-compression we're applying. Uh, this is the PF6 coil uh, being installed. Uh, the reason I chose this is if you look carefully, you can see most of the features of this coil uh, that I showed earlier as a diagram. In particular, that if you look carefully to the right side of the coil, you can see projecting down a cylinder. That's the coil terminal region. You can see uh, kind of horizontal uh, white and black boxes uh, on the surface. Those are the connections between the pancakes. These were shown in purple in the earlier drawing. You can see some vertical bars between uh, top and bottom. Uh, these are the clamps uh, on the coil. They're the ones that are attaching it to the crane and they're the ones that will attach it to the TF coils. And then you, you can't see the coil surface. You've got the protection plates, uh, the, the sort of gray things on the, uh, the top at uh, the bottom. Uh, here, this is a completed TF coil. So on the left, you can see, looking down on it, uh, you can see the nose region uh, on the, the long straight part on the right. Uh, you can see quite nicely here the intercoil structures. You can see the, the lines running out radially above and below the inner leg. That's the inner intercoil shear keys. And then you can see the big flanges on the outside on the left, which are the uh, intermediate outer intercoil structures, IOIS. And then top and bottom, you can see next to the yellow bit, the thing with the holes, that's the OIS. Uh, and at the bottom of the coil, you can just about see the terminal region. Uh, then on the, the middle is a, is a picture of the coils being prepared in, in building 73-2. Uh, this shows you a coil terminal box. Again, you can relate this to the picture. You've got, uh, th this is P PF4 CTB being lowered down to the, the B2. You can qu see quite nicely on this, at the, on the right side, there's the dry box. In the middle with all the blue bits on top, that's the valving. 
uh, the, the helium supplies uh, and venting system. Then the, the box on the, uh, on the left, that's the S-bends, which give you a thermal sense um, flexibility. And then the cir circular bits st sticking out on the left, that's what connects to the cryostat feed through and leads to the vacuum vessel and then into the cryostat. Uh, on the left, you can see some of the internal components of the uh, of, of these feeders. Uh, the, the, the top left shows you all the pipes and the buzz bars, the square bits of the joints, uh, an intermediate joint. That's the buzz bars. Uh, the, the one on the bottom left shows you the typical piping layout inside, underneath the valves. This is a picture of a, of a, a cryostat feed through under fabrication, the ASIPP long steel thing. Uh, on the right, you can see what goes inside it. This, this is the buzz bars, then there's a lot of pipes in addition to this. It's, it's very full of equipment. Uh, this is the uh, summary now. The notional cost of the magnets uh, is something around uh, 1.4 billion euros. The real costs are difficult to estimate, but they're probably around 2 billion euros. The, the domestic agencies generally had to pay more than was seen in ETA credits. Uh, and about 90% of that is spent. Uh, the distribution here between the parties is nominal because, it, 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 of course, some of them had significant overcosts. The Japanese contribution looks artificially large because a big chunk of it was paid by F4E under the host site agreement. The rate, relative cost um, contributions are shown on the right. This is a little bit interesting as to with the proportional costs of the superconductor. You can see the bright green, uh, the uh, the bright green, the purple. I think it's blue, uh, and then the deep green. So the the three colours in the pie chart on the left, almost fifty percent of the magnets is conductor cost. The rest is the magnets, uh, and uh, yeah, the rest is the magnets. And out of the magnets, these structures are a very significant component. So it's the, the dominant cost is not actually winding the coils or the, the, the winding packs, it's the conductors and the structures. Uh, possibly the overspend on, on the magnets themselves was higher so that this would rebalance a bit. Uh, okay, and then as a final slide to finish, uh, this is a summary. We've got some 10,000 tons of coils and coil structures. The stored magnetic energy is about 51 gigajoules. Uh, this produces the magnetic fields that are actually all the actuators. The magnets do everything to form the plasma, control the plasma. So without magnets, no plasma. Uh, there's been a huge development. Uh, we started a lot of this work back in, uh, in, the, early, in the mid 90s. Uh, so that by the mid to 2000s, we're in a position to write the procurement arrangements and get started fairly early with the uh, magnet manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing is now getting com towards completion uh, and component deliveries are flowing rapidly, in fact, possibly more rapidly than they can be handled by assembly. Construction's well underway. Uh, you can see, of course, some huge progress in the last couple of years, uh, and it's coming together. The next step where we're starting to look now quite actively is commissioning and operations. So thank you for your attention.